Continuing our look at heart health here on the exam room podcast brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And today we are privileged to be joined by the medical director from Montgomery heart and wellness in Houston, Texas. He is also the man behind this exciting new docu series called heart and soul of a champion. The first season just about to be released. We have so much to talk about here today. Just absolutely extraordinary. Could not be more excited to welcome Dr. Baxter Montgomery back to the exam room. My friend, thank you so very much for taking the time. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having me. You are incredibly busy right now. I know you're ramping up, getting ready to release the first season of Heart and Soul of a Champion, which focuses on athletes. I believe it's even called the Athlete Edition. Um, yes. Let's talk about this series. I had the opportunity to preview the first couple of episodes, and I got to tell you, this is is one of the best documentaries that I've ever seen, not just a plant-based documentary. The way that you're able to relay information and do some incredible storytelling, I think is quite literally going to change and save a lot of lives. So before I even ask the first question, just I wanted to give you an attaboy and a pat on the back because this is a powerful piece of work. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thanks for the kind words. It means a lot. Absolutely. And so this new docu-series, let me tell the exam roomies a little bit about it. Um, as you put on your website, heartandsoulofachampion.com, this is uh, innovative, life-changing uh, Montgomery Heart and Wellness in, uh, Integrative Health Program, which is a mouthful to say. But basically what this is, Dr. Montgomery, is the future of medicine. That's what you have impressed upon me in our conversations leading up to this. Why do you consider this to be the future of medicine? You know, I think it's a necessary future because our current way of practicing medicine is one that doesn't give us very great returns. You know, we spend more money year after year on what we call health care or sick care. Some people may refer to it as. Uh, but despite that, uh, we get sicker. Uh, illness has become the norm uh, since 2019 to now. And from 2019 to 2021, uh, the life expectancy here in the United States has decreased by 2.7 uh, years. Uh, and that's the lowest it's been since 1996. <clears throat> and so, you know, we are in a healthcare crisis. So the current approach to medicine, which is strictly using uh, prescribed uh, prescription medications and, and procedures and surgeries without any attention to aggressive lifestyle intervention is one that has to change. So it's our you know, thinking at Montgomery Heart and Wellness is that lifestyle intervention should be the foundation of healthcare. And so our approach to um, uh, this approach using integrative care uses a lifestyle intervention first and foremost, not only in the setting where you're trying to prevent something from happening five or 10 years from now, but if someone's acutely ill, lifestyle intervention needs to be integrated with any other type of acute medical intervention. If someone has some chronic illness and a lot of medications or have pending surgeries, an aggressive lifestyle intervention has to be intervened. So what the DACA series does is that it opens, pulls the curtains back and allows uh, the viewer to see exactly what that means. Uh, and it does it in the context of seeing individuals coming and um, changing their lives, coming and, and, and going through their lifestyle journeys. Uh, it shows the ups and the downs. It shows some of the challenges that are involved. Uh, and, and the storytelling aspect I thought was very important because we often deal with disease states as statistics. You know, X number of people with heart disease, X number of people with diabetes, et cetera. But we, we all have to start to put a face behind these diseases. And hopefully the docu-series will help us do that. The thing that I really enjoyed about this documentary, the, this docu-series, is that it really does, as you were saying, a phenomenal job of storytelling, but you're not just telling simple stories here. I mean, you have NFL Hall of Famers in this docu-series, but then you also have somebody who would not be recognized on the street, and yet somehow... I became as emotionally invested in Mr. Antonio Pope's story as I was with Hall of Famer Daryl Green. And so 
I actually want to start with Mr. Pope, who um, had been to a number of hospitals, a number of doctors. And this was even mentioned in, in the docuseries that one of the hospitals did not want to do anything with him because his heart was only pumping with 10 percent efficiency. And as I understand it, he was on kind of like a last chance medication um, just to be able to survive day to day. When somebody comes through your doors mm -hmm. and they are in that rough a shape, I mean, what what goes through your mind as a doctor? Are you thinking always that this is this is something that is correctable or like how do you even begin to wrap your head around this as a doctor? You know, that's a great question. And we frequently see patients like Mr. Pope who come to our center, whether they're local or from out of state, patients find from around the country. Uh, and Mr. Pope was on a melanone infusion pump, which is a medication, as you indicated, is one that's typically a last resort or sort of a late term, you know, therapy for patients with heart failure. Um, and what I'll say uh, point blank is that it doesn't matter how sick the patient is. It's always uh, my mindset that there's a chance it can turn around and a very good chance it can turn around. And I don't say that just to be, you know, bragging or, or say that just to, to um, you know, be arrogant. Uh, but that mindset is based on our experience. You know, we've had patients who were so sick, they were given up for hospice, they were too sick for surgery. I've had uh, some patients on life support uh, with whom we are able to help the bodies turn around and then walk out of the hospital. So we've seen firsthand uh, individuals uh, who are very, very ill in dire straits, uh, whose body is able to turn around when the right type of approach is used. Now, that doesn't mean it always happens. It just means that there's a possibility and a very good possibility that they can turn around. So, so that's one thing. So our experience tells us that this can happen. But the other reason I have that mindset is that it's important and I try to convey this to my patients, it's always important that you have a positive, a can-do mindset, because you know all of our possibilities start with the mindset that this can happen, with the mindset that we can do this. So if, if, if I'm their treating physician and I don't have the mindset that, hey, you're gonna get better, then my goodness, that, that puts the patient at a major disadvantage. So I always have the mindset that my patients are gonna get better, and I have the mindset I'm going to do everything I can to help them achieve that. And so, so the answer is yes. When Mr. Pope came, we were of the mindset uh, that we could help him get better. We had a, a game plan in place. And, uh, and that's our approach with every patient who come in, despite how ill they are. And, you know, I think that it was kind of obvious that at least his sisters who had traveled with him from Virginia definitely shared that mindset. If you're willing to travel all that way after mm -hmm. being told you're too sick to even operate, mm -hmm. I think that, that that goes like never give up mentality. And that that really is critically important. I mean, we've seen that even uh, bore out in studies. You know, the more positive a, a person's mindset is, the the better their health outcome tends to be. Um, is that all psychosomatic or is there something physiological that happens in the body because you have this can-do attitude as well? I think it's physiological. I mean, we call it psychosomatic. I mean, that, that, that phraseology is probably linked to the biology of, you know, the physiology of it. I mean, you have to have the confidence that you can do things because your body then directs the rest of your physiology. The brain directs us in terms of where we want to go and where we need to go. And so, you know, if we have the mindset that we can do something, it gives us a much better chance of doing what we plan to do. So that goes, you know, for getting well. Uh, and it can also, you know, conversely go for being sick. If you have the mindset, well, I'm sick and I'm very tired uh, all the time and I'm not going to get better then that negative mindset is going to work against your body's ability to heal itself. So, so it starts with the mindset for sure. And let's also talk about how your mindset shifted very early in the docuseries. I mean, it was like straight away, you talked about this big breakthrough that you had at the age of 35. Mm -hmm. um, and you went through this, uh, this detox at that age. What led you up to that point where you realized, yeah, my health isn't quite where it needs to be. Let me find out what else I can do. 
you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, I was, uh, like I often say, indoctrinated into this, you know, aggressive medical training. You know, my background is in internal medicine and my next specialty, subspecialty is cardiology and then another sub subspecialty, cardiac electrophysiology. And after many years of training that I was also in practice for a long time and, and using these skills and the like. Uh, and it was when I noticed my health started to deteriorate. The simple inspiration was that I didn't want to take the medications or undergo the treatments that I was prescribing other patients. It was just that simple. You know, it wasn't anything too profound. And so I started, you know, researching natural cures and, and things of the like. And, uh, and I came across one common denominator is, you know, healthy diet. And the common denominator of a healthy diet was plant-based nutrition. And so one thing led to another. Uh, and my personal experience went, you know, was that I started off a, a nutritional detox, a juice feast, and uh, I felt amazing. Uh, and so, you know, when I saw the incredible you know, effects it had on me, I then thought to myself, I said, let me try this on some of my patients. And I tried on some of my patients who were very ill. And uh, lo and behold, you know, I saw amazing uh, positive results in patients, not, not in a matter of months or years. But in a matter of days to weeks, uh, I saw some of the things that I'd never seen in my medical practice ever in terms of I just simply putting patients on a natural plant based diet. Uh, and so, you know, in 10 days to come back, I was able to wean them off medications and get them off oxygen and have them walk when they couldn't walk. Uh, and these were miraculous things. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I practice more than a quarter century in the world's largest medical center. We have three heart transplant centers in walking distance. We have everything in medical technology any place on the planet Earth for the most part. And so it's not like I wasn't exposed to the best that medicine had to offer. But despite being exposed to that, by simply putting patients on a natural plant-based diet, I saw amazing health recoveries that I had never seen before in my professional practice in the world's largest medical center. All right, so let me ask you kind of a fun question then, because when you're talking about prescribing nutrition, essentially, and a healthier lifestyle, I mean, that's so <clears throat> counter to the majority of advice that is prescribed by doctors, right? Yeah. Were you nervous at all the first time you brought that up with a patient? Were you like, eh, I don't know how they're going to react to it, but I'm just going to throw it out there and see if it sticks. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I don't think I've been asked that question before, but you know, I really wasn't nervous. I mean, looking back on that experience, uh, I was so excited about it that it really didn't, you know, sort of like, you know, you're finding, you know, something amazing in your house and you're jumping up, running around the neighborhood. You don't realize you're having pajamas on or something in your underwear. I don't know. But the point is that when I started, you know, uh, recommending this to patients, I, you know, I was already overwhelmed with the positive benefits that it had, and you know, that I, I personally experienced. But one thing I did realize that I realized that it was going to be challenging because I, I wasn't telling patients to cut back on this, and cut back on that. You know, I was having patients go strictly on raw plant foods, not a bite, drop, or crumb of anything that, other than that. And so I knew that that was a, a very, very challenging, you know, dietary change. So it wasn't I wasn't using the traditional moderation, make change, eat more salads. No, eat only salads, drink only water, or cold pressed juice or smoothies. So what I did is that, and fortunately, I, I used this approach early on, I would I would do very quick follow-ups. So that was the key. So I'd start someone on the regimen, I'd write out specifically what they had to eat, write out what they had to avoid 100%, and I said, come back and see me in seven days. Now, that seven days, coming back, get, you know, get the repeat sermon uh, was important because it allows for a high percentage of compliance in that seven-day period. That's number one. Number two, the fact that the regimen was so precise, as I like to say, some people say so extreme, that they got results, positive results in a very short period of time. So in seven days, they're coming back and I'm able to cut back on the medications and weights down a lot, et cetera. So they're doing so much better in seven days. So even though they're struggling with the diet and struggling with missing the, their so-called favorite foods, they have the counter uh, experience of positive results. And so then at that seven day mark, I said, well, wait, give me another seven days and then another seven days. And so we worked out this whole process that we created like a four week arbitrary period of time. And we created a nutritional boot camp class and detox. So over time, I created more and more support materials. Because one thing I learned 
is that people were able to comply with this. They just need more support, more encouragement, group classes and the like. And we create these programs over time. How, what are, what are your group classes like? Um, I have seen them work kind of as a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, they can be really, really, really great. But on the other hand, uh, I've also seen uh, where uh, it can quickly turn into a group of enablers. How do you ensure with your, your groups that they kind of stay on the straight and narrow? You know, it's a great question. Um, we, we've had good results with the group program. So we started out with what we call as a nutritional boot camp class. So the original boot camp classes, uh, and this, this, the boot camp classes uh, uh, developed out of my one on one consultations when I would have patients come back, you know, a series of, you know, uh, you know four, seven day periods and, and, and what have you. So I started to do it with large groups. I say large groups, groups of say 25 to 30 people in the group. We hold them in our main lobby and, and they were on Saturday mornings, uh, sometimes Saturday mornings and afternoons, and then sometimes Sunday mornings when the class filled up. <clears throat> but what we, we did is that we had a curriculum. It was a structured program. So creating structure uh, really made uh, uh, made a difference. Uh, and the, the, the food prescription aspect was very important because we were very precise in, in terms of telling people what to eat, what not to eat. That's one. Also, we had developed what's, uh, what we refer to as a food classification system. It's a simple zero to 10 classification system where the lower the number is, the healthier the food, the higher the number, the least healthy. Uh, Plant-based food stops at food level six, uh, excuse me, at level six. Uh, and so we don't uh, recommend people eat beyond level six. The sicker they are, the lower the numbers. And so we may prescribe foods in a different, you know, uh, uh, range, say zero to one or zero to three or zero to four. Uh, so we use that as an approach to sort of, so the level of precision helps people out. Uh, I started out moderating the class. I trained nutritionists to then moderate the classes. Uh, and then we also had support with our, our chef. We eventually built in a nutrition center and then a restaurant and grocery store on our site which also supports. So creating structure, uh, precision from the standpoint of, of uh, food prescription, and also you know, giving support in terms of the foods and recipes and the like, I really, I think, helped us out tremendously. I, I think so. I mean, that that all in one kind of approach there is really important, especially early on uh, in, in their journeys. I think you, as they transform and break all of those old habits to have that solution right there with the grocery store with the, with the cafe I, I just think that that's that is key um yeah. as someone who had a lot of unhealthy heart habits back in the day i think you know that that all-encompassing approach is absolutely critical um you mentioned that you're within walking distance of three world-class heart transplant centers there um one of the questions that has never been raised here on the show is what is the benefit of a plant-based diet, a healthy diet on somebody who has had a heart transplant at that point? Do they still get the same benefits as somebody um, who has not undergone that? Like what, what is the upside there? Well, I won't say the benefits are exactly the same. Someone who's had a heart transplant, uh, for instance, we won't be able to wean them off all of their medication. We'll have to leave them on the anti-rejection medications. Um, with that being said, uh, there are other benefits that are, are, are very good. So, for example, um, if I have someone with a transplant of any organ, heart transplant, kidney transplant, uh, they benefit from a, a natural plant-based diet because it reduces you know, other problems. I mean, you know, they also are, are, are at risk for hypertension, hyperlipidemia, the risk for liver dysfunction, et cetera, uh, even though they have a transplanted organ. So if you're eating a natural, healthy diet, it allows the body to maintain biochemical and physiological balance. So, I mean, if you if you look at the, the flip side of that, if someone has is, is, had a transplant and they're eating junk food all the time, well, a bad diet, let's just look at the immune system since it, you know, naturally applies to a transplant situation. In the transplanted uh, patient, you don't want to have the immune system revved up. That's why you have anti-rejection medication, which suppress the immune system. Uh, because you do have, a, even though there's a certain amount of, of, of tissue matching 
uh, there's still a foreign uh, tissue in the body. So there's a risk of, of rejection and that rejection is going to be mediated by the immune system. Uh, so if you're consuming a diet that's very unhealthy, an unhealthy diet uh, creates uh, immune disarray, which could be an immune system that uh, can be overly suppressed, but it can also be an immune system that's revved up. And so an immune system that's successfully revved up uh, can potentiate rejection uh, more aggressively than the immune system that's, you know, kept uh, in, 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 uh, in normal state of condition. So a natural diet consuming natural foods that are designed for the human body uh, allow for the immune system to be robust, but also under control. Uh, but if you're consuming unhealthy foods, that immune system will not be under control. And uh, if it's overly suppressed, then you'll be predisposed to infections and cancers. If it's, uh, you know, overly revved up, then from the transplant patient standpoint, they're going to be at risk for uh, rejection. So these individuals benefit at least from that standpoint, in addition to the fact that, you know, they have less arthritis or they have less hypercholesterolemia or they're on fewer other medications that may have drug-drug interaction. Uh, so you, you're really looking at very similar benefits uh, in both populations. The, the main exception is that someone with heart failure who hasn't had a transplant has a chance of being weaned off all of their medication. A post-transplant person does not. Uh, for, forgive me, I, I'm not too familiar with heart transplants. What um, is there kind of an expiration date on a heart um, that's that's been transplanted? Is it 20 years? Is it 30 years? Can it last a lifetime? Yeah, it. You know, there are individuals who I've seen who you know live with a heart transplant for 20 years and they do very well. The individuals who have lots of complications, they may die within a year or two, uh, you know, and, and everyone's course is different. And I think the, the reasons are simply related to what I outlined. You know, when, when we do a heart transplant, you know, we don't necessarily pay attention to the person's lifestyle. So if someone gets the transplant, they get the anti-rejection medication and they're sent home. But where's the food prescription? You know, uh, the same thing when someone gets a bypass surgery. Where's the food prescription? Same thing with someone who gets a stent. Where's the food prescription? So, you know, we, we go through a lot of trouble and do these wonderful things. You know, we have very talented physicians, very, you know, expert, you know, medical teams. And, and we're, we're doing these amazing things for patients. But then it's sent home and there's no attention paid to what they're putting in their mouths. And so you have a broad spectrum in terms of, you know, who's successful and who's not. And, and a lot of it has to do with how well they're taking care of their bodies. And the patients that we've seen who've come in post-transplant, uh, there's a heart transplant person we dealt with, uh, came to mind, uh, and she did quite well. She did better after she underwent our detox program. We were able to wean a lot of her medications off. She felt better. Her functional status was better. She exercised longer. And so even though she wasn't going through rejection before, she her health improved because you know the body's more than just the transplanted organ. It's the body working in, in, in concert with uh, other organs as well. So, so yeah, the lifespan varies because, you know, we, and it's really hard to put uh, uh, a pinpoint on that because the lifestyle of the individual varies and, and we don't pay enough attention to that. Yeah, I wish that there, I, I really doubt that there have been studies uh, on the effect of diet for uh, heart transplant recipients. Um, but if Not there really. were to be one, I mean, I, I assume that um, the plant-based diet, your hypothesis anyway, would be that that would certainly um, aid in promoting a greater longevity for that person. Yes, I think so. I think so for sure. All right, let's go back to the docu series here. Um, one of the things that caught me off guard, in all honesty, you have uh, Daryl Green, who is a world class athlete, Hall of Fame NFL player, a legend here in the Washington, D.C. area for his time with the Commanders. And I was shocked that here's this gentleman, 62 years old, still looks to be in pretty good shape. And his, his blood pressure was through the roof. How common is it to see somebody that's relatively fit uh, have such enormously high blood pressure? It was like 191 over 114, yeah. 114, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> we, you know, we see it quite often. I mean, obviously, we have a skewed population, but 
we see it quite often because, you know, they, they call blood pressure the silent killer. Um, you know, coronary artery disease is a silent killer because you have individual and, and one individual, Mr. Banks, had coronary disease and he was perhaps the most physically fit in the group. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very common for us to see individuals coming in with elevated blood pressure. They don't know about it, uh, especially if they haven't, you know, seen a doctor in a, in a very long time or haven't checked their blood pressure in a very long time. Uh, we can see it. And again, it undergoes the, 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 the biochemical imbalance. And, and the way I would think of it is simply this, you know, if, if, it's, uh, if you're having a, a heavy downpour of rain, and uh, you know, people are just walking through the rain. And this is take away raincoats and, and umbrellas. If you're walking through the rain, then you know what percentage of people are going to get wet? Well, pretty much everybody. And so I look at the standard American lifestyle as the rain. Uh, if if you, you know, if you're walking through the standard American lifestyle way of eating, primarily the standard American dietary lifestyle, 100 percent of the people are going to get sick in one form or fashion. Now, that illness may not be hypertension, it may be high cholesterol, it may be liver dysfunction, it may be mood disorders, it may be obesity, but 100% of people are going to get sick, and how they get sick is determined based on the genetics. And essentially, that's what we're dealing with here in the United States. You know, people are walking through the standard American lifestyle and uh, the standard American lifestyle way of eating, but also lack of exercise and the like. And, and what's happening there is that these individuals are suffering from chronic illness. That's why sickness essentially is the norm. Uh, and so it's not uncommon to see someone like Mr. Green come in with a blood pressure 191 over 114. Uh, however, you know, we, we, you know, we didn't flinch. Uh, we talked to him. We didn't, you know, get alarmed. Uh, we addressed the problem and, and, and the viewers will see you know, exactly what we do in the uh, docu series. Uh, I loved um, how you had a quorum with uh, the the other staffers in your office to determine what the course of treatment was going to be. I, I honestly love that part of the docuseries as well, as you guys kind of talk about what that course of treatment is going to be and the reasons why. And you do a great job of walking the viewer through that. So uh, my hat's off to you. I, I don't, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but um, it is just fascinating. I do have to ask you about one of the things that was involved in that treatment. And, and you mentioned it already in the interview was the infrared sauna. What in the world is this thing? How is that benefiting a person's health? Yeah, infrared sauna is a modality we've recently added. Uh, it's been around for some time, but uh, the science behind it is that it's very effective in individuals with heart, heart failure. Uh, there's data out of uh, Japan and also data out of Finland. And so the data out of Finland is not only with patients with heart failure, but also coronary artery disease. Uh, what we do know is that it, it uh, allows for red blood cells and probably even endothelial cells to increase nitric oxide production for the reduction in blood pressure. It creates a physiological exercise effect, and, and the mechanism there is probably the fact that the body has to, to maintain the regulated temperature, and, and temperature regulatory mechanisms you know, uh, often involves increasing cardiac output or increasing circulation. Uh, but the other things that uh, some scientists have found out at the cellular level, so it's uh, found to increase heat shock protein 60, uh, which helps maintain intracellular uh, protein molecules to keep them from de denaturing. Uh, and there are many other, you know, uh, components of benefit that uh, has been found to, to, as a, you know, in, in, ultras in, in sauna therapy to be beneficial. My man was sweating in there too. I mean, oh, well, yeah. I mean, it is a sauna, but boy, did he was right. glistening, man. <laughs> was, yeah, yeah. They, do, they have documented removing toxins out through the sweat, through the skin. So that's another mechanism. So it's a, sort of a direct detox effect as well. So, okay. Yeah. So that's a real thing. So when you're talking about expelling toxins from the system, I mean, how important is it that we sweat? You know, sweating is important. I mean, one, uh, hopefully people, you know, have uh, effective sweat uh, glands, but sweating is important because it does move toxins through the skin, uh, through the system. Uh, and again, you know, you want to be in a situation where you can sweat, so you want to make sure you're well hydrated. Uh, and that's why we emphasize hydration, you know, in any setting, especially in the setting where individuals are getting uh, sauna therapy. Uh, hydration is very important because it improves, you know, your internal showering effect or circulation and allows your body to flush toxins out through either, whether it's through the GI tract or through the, the, uh, the kidneys and, and the urine 
or through the skin with sweat. So our, our, our need to flush and cleanse our system, either by sweat or bowel movements or, or urinary output, uh, is important. And so that's how we cleanse and freshen and flush out, sort of like power washing your driveway periodically. <laughs> All right. Just a, a couple of more here. Thanks for being so generous with your time. Um, I, I want to do some things here, just kind of really focus in on some practical tips that people can walk away from today and put into practice with their own life. And one of the things that I would love to, to hear you talk about is what the effect on cardiovascular fitness would be if somebody were to eat a regular baked potato versus chopping up that potato and then frying it in oil and turning it into a French fry. You you still have potatoes, but what's the difference with the cardiovascular fitness there? Yeah, well, certainly the fried potato will have adverse effects on the, the vascular system. And so you probably have, just by, just by consuming the, the fried potato, uh, you cause uh, damage in the endothelial cells. You have the, the, the fried oils and, and the fried potato itself. Uh, you have lots of, you'll increase oxidative stress and inflammation at the same time. And uh, that has adverse effect on mitochondrial function, which then has reduction in ATP production, which then has reduction in, in cardiovascular performance and so on and so forth. So it, the fried potato is not very very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. I, I assume we can put potato chips into that same category. I, I assume so. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But okay. But now somebody in all honesty, doc, may be watching this and say, yeah, but what about the baked potato chips? Yeah, Aren't those yeah. a healthier option? You, you know, some baked potato chips are, are baked with oil. So you have a heated oil, which is very problematic. Now is a baked potato chip less evil than a fried potato chip? You know, I don't know the answer to that, but I think they're very close. There's somebody in, in, in our situation with somebody coming in who's who's in the throes of heart failure, who's uh, whose blood pressure 191 or 114, you know, a baked potato versus a fried potato, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Neither are going to help them out. And so we just throw them both out. But I guess if someone's trying to split hairs and say, well, the baked potato is not as evil as a fried potato, they might have an argument there, but it's not going to help their health long term or even short term for that matter. Right. And, and just clarification, if we're talking about a baked potato chip, not potato chip, not, yeah, not, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. a regular not baked regular potato, baked potato. Right. nothing wrong with the regular baked potato. Right. Yeah. Right. If you don't overbake it, if you don't like some people like overbake it and it's like, you know, dark and stuff like that. I'd rather boil the potato. But if I if you ask me my preference on potatoes, I go boil first and bake second and then, you know, avoid the rest. Right. So, well, I think just from a flavor standpoint, that's not bad because you're going to get a softer potato at that point. Right. So and, yeah. and the chars, that's really kind of the problematic part. Correct. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm careful. When I say baked potato because people aren't always careful in terms of how they bake their potatoes and you get the char, which can cause, you know, the charring of the the, uh, the um, uh, carbohydrates, you know, creates acrylamides and probably other toxins we don't know about. All right. And last question for you. If you were to give uh, your patients a list of maybe three to five foods that you would consider to be the heart healthiest, what would be on your list? Well, um, first and foremost is a, a good quality water, an alkaline water. Some people can use distilled water, reinfused with plants. Uh, that would be number one. Number two would be uh, very hydrating uh, foods, whether it's a cucumber or a cantaloupe or something. So like the melons are very high, you know, celery. So very hydrating uh, raw plant foods. And then of course the leafy greens would be a very close third uh, to that. Um, if you're going to eat cooked foods, the cooked foods I would recommend uh, would be either steamed uh, greens or uh, beans that are, are cooked uh, if you're going to eat cooked foods. So that those would be at the top of my list. But I go after the hydrating uh, plant foods first, uh, and, you know, right behind water. And maybe the, the hydrating plant foods, maybe even before water. So if someone's able to consume, you know, four cucumbers and you know, half a cantaloupe of water, you're going to be hydrated very well. And you may not need so much water. But, but hydration, foods that are very hydrating, is very high on my list. And then next to that will be leafy greens, which... May not, may not necessarily be very hydrating if you're talking about spinach and kale, uh, broccoli is hydrating with the stems, but they would be very next on the list because they have lots of protein and, and minerals and phytonutrients. 
uh, sea vegetables will be mixed in that with the uh, uh, land greens because they're very high in minerals because many of us are deficient in minerals. Um, and then if you want to add some cooked foods for savoriness, you can have your boiled potatoes, or be that preferably a yam or some of the smaller purple potatoes, if it's not a potato, uh, or beans, uh, black beans, I think are good, red beans are good, uh, or the like. You're putting a premium on hydration there, and it wasn't too terribly long ago I was reading an article that was saying that we are, a lot of us in this country, uh, chronically dehydrated and don't even realize it. Why is that so dangerous when it comes to the heart? Yeah, it's very dangerous because um, it's a great question, you know, and it's something we deal with a little bit in the docu series, but without spoiling that, someone who's dehydrated, just think about it. <clears throat> If you think about circulation, um, you know, circulation requires a, 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 a fluid medium, you know, to, to circulate. So if the heart's going to circulate blood, uh, and let's say a normal cardiac output, cardiac output is just a term we use for circulation, is five liters per minute. So that's a certain amount of volume being circulated over a certain unit of time. So uh, if I have, you know, five liters a minute, and let's say the, the heart can, you know, squeeze out, you know, uh, you know, that five liters in a matter of 40 beats in a minute, uh, or, you know, let's say 60 beats in a minute, it can circulate five liters. But then if the body only has two and a half liters, then the heart's going to have to beat faster because it's having to circulate the same amount of volume with the lower, same amount of circulation volume per unit of time with less volume. So in other words, the smaller amount of volume I have, the more frequent I'm going to have to say, uh, scoop the bucket. If I have a bucket that's a liter versus a bucket that's half a liter, I've got to scoop twice as fast with a half liter bucket than I do with the full liter bucket. So the more volume you have, the less frequent your heart has to contract therefore to circulate the less volume you have the faster the heart has to beat and then therefore it works itself so we see a similar type thing in someone with congestive heart failure congestive heart failure by definition is the inability of the body's heart to circulate uh, blood commiserate to the body's needs so if someone has a weak heart that can't circulate adequately that's the underlying cause of poor circulation so on heart failure but then let's say someone has a normal heart but they have a normal heart, but then they're very, very dehydrated. When they're very, very dehydrated, then they're not able to circulate blood commiserate to the body's needs. So if you look at somebody who's with a normal heart, quote unquote, but who's severely dehydrated, they have the same end result as somebody with an abnormal heart that's weak, that can also not, that can't circulate blood commiserate to the body's need in the same fashion. So if you're very, very dehydrated, uh, and many of the symptoms of severe dehydration are similar to that of heart failure. You, to some extent, giving yourself a similar physiology of somebody with heart failure. And so by simply hydrating yourself more effectively, uh, you can uh, counter that. There's a, a book, I'm, I'm blanking on the author's name, that, that is, is a very long Indian name, they call him Dr. Batman, but he has a book titled, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. And he outlines a lot of chronic illnesses that people have that... Um, well, simply due to dehydration. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Man, I could talk to you for days, but uh, here's the deal. <laughs> let me let me give you guys a couple of important dates to keep in mind. Number one, March 18th. That is the premiere of Heart and Soul of a Champion Season 1, Athlete Edition. Um, this is a must-watch, and if you just can't wait, head over to heartandsoulofachampion.com right now. You can register and get the first episode absolutely for free right now at the website. We've included a link for you down below in the show description or in the episode notes. And Dr. M, I can't wait for you to come here to the D.C. area because you're going to be speaking again at the Fairfax Veg Fest this year as yes. well in Herndon, Virginia on April 23rd. You can go to fairfaxvegfest.org for all of that information as well. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait for the full season to drop. I'm absolutely hooked with what I have seen so far. And as I said, this is the best series that I've seen in a very, very, very long time. My hat is off to you. This is a tremendous, tremendous service that you're doing to so many people. 
Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the kind words. And, and I look forward to getting to DC and, and uh, uh, perhaps we can discuss that um, you know panel we mentioned earlier and maybe we can do something around then. You got it, my friend. Can't wait. Thank you so much. Take care. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.